Hello, this is David Benign. In this video, I'm going to show you how to safely remove rows and columns so that you're less likely to get errors in the future. There are three rules to generally apply with Power Query to make it future-proofed or error-proofed. Number one is avoid naming columns in the code as much as possible. The second one is avoid using hard coding. Like if you say remove top five rows, then you're referencing the number five. And the third one is try and maximize the steps that have this symbol because these are editable easily later on. These options I find not to be error-proofed. This is an angry dog, isn't he? <laughs> so remove columns, keep rows and remove rows. Generally, I don't avoid these and I'll explain why. So let's go into Power Query. So this is the data that I want cleaned up. Notice there are some blank columns, also some columns that I don't need, like these ones. And notice that the rows start on five. Five is where my headers are. So I'm going to get data from this file. Here I am in Power Query. So it has done these automatically. It starts with the source. And like I said before, you want to aim for these cogs, because if I click that, I can very easily change the file by clicking browse there. This change type one doesn't have one. And in fact, this is one of the worst Power Query transformations that there is because it references every single column. Uh, so I'm going to click X there and I'm going to disable that in the settings. So go to file, options and settings and query options. And then I'm going to choose data load and untick this automatically detect column types, etc. Notice that it is in current workbook and not in global which unfortunately means you have to redo this on every fresh Excel file or Power BI file. The other setting you might want is in the view tab, you want to see the formula bar. Even if you're not editing it, because I know it's complicated code, you it's good to have it there so you can see what it's doing as you go along. So over here, uh, what I wanna do is I want to remove the rows. So I'm going to untick promoted headers because that's irrelevant here. My headers are in row number five. Now what you might be tempted to do is go to the home tab, choose remove rows and remove top rows and remove four rows here. And then you can go here and choose use first row as headers. But that is bad practice and let me explain why. If I go to my source and I click here, I go to browse and I choose Cambodia data, press OK. And then the next step in navigation shows that I have seven blanks until my headers are in row number eight. So if I remove a hard coded value of four, that's not going to help. Now I could if I want to change this, but it's not dynamic based on how many rows there are. So that's not what I wanna do. And also, I have some empty rows at the bottom, and these could also be dynamic. So removing bottom rows, where you hard code the number of rows, could also be bad practice. In fact, the way that I'm gonna do this is not using that feature at all. What I'm gonna do is go to a column that has data on every row. So for example, this one will do, and I'm going to choose remove empty. Now that just clearly removes the top ones that have empty cells in them and underneath removes those as well. Usually that would be enough, but in certain cases you might have to also manually choose something else as a filter. So if you have something that says total, for example, you might have to remove that manually. But usually I find that it works pretty well if you just remove empty. I will explain later on in this video exactly what remove empty does. So check that out at the end of this video. Because then if I use my first row as headers, it will work. And if I change the source back to the other file, and then go here, that will also work pretty well. So that is my advice with remove rows and we'll see that in a more complicated example in a little bit as well. So going through these, I don't like top and bottom rows as I said, you need to hard code a value in that's not dynamic. Alternate rows, I don't really have much of a use case for it. 
If it's needed to return every other row, then I generally find that removing MT with filter is good enough. Uh, remove duplicates I do use, but that's for a different use case. And remove blank rows and remove errors I very rarely use either. Remove blank rows, that's a very similar action to doing it with a filter, but I prefer it with a filter. In the keep rows options, so similarly, these three need you to hard code a number. I don't like doing that. And these two, I do sometimes use them, but that's a completely different use case. It's generally queries that are not loading and it's just to check where my underlying data might have issues that I need to further explore. So next comes how to remove columns. Now, what you might be tempted to do, and again, what beginners often do is they click on the column that they don't like and they press delete and that removes the column. And they click on say these two, if you hold down control or shift, you can choose remove columns that does the same thing. And that adds them there to the remove columns one. And then they click on these ones and remove columns as well. Now, that might look like it's the easier way to do it, but you'll notice that there isn't a cog here. So if I want to backtrack and not remove those columns, then it does break my query. The other reason I don't like using the remove columns tab is because, well, let me remove a couple more. Let's say I don't want these ones. Um, I have referenced the names of the columns here in my code. Now, as I said, you want to reference the fewest number of columns possible. And if the first thing that I do is I remove the ones that I don't need, then I'm potentially causing the query to break because someone might rename these in the future and it will break. Whereas it's much safer to only refer to the columns that I want to keep. Now I'm going to show you another way to do it. So there are two ways, but they both end up with the same results. So you could go to choose columns and then here you could just pre-select the ones that you want to keep like say just these ones, for example. And then we'll only keep those. Notice now that I have this cog. And if I click on there, I can go back and edit it. And that's why it's quite useful. Plus also, I haven't referenced all these other column names that I'm just never gonna use in my data. So if I X out of this, I'm gonna show you the other way, which is essentially pre-select the columns that you want hold down shift or and control to pre-select them and then go to remove columns drop down and remove other columns. Notice that that has changed this setting here and over here I can now go to the cog and I can edit it in the same way as choose columns. In fact, removed other columns and choose columns does the exact same step. The code is identical. So that is how to safely remove columns. Don't use this one, but use either this one or this one. Notice as well that you can also right click and choose remove other columns over here or remove columns, they're both there. Now there is one exception, one time that I find it's okay to choose remove columns. And that is for example, if we add a column ourselves. So if I add a column myself, I can choose an index column. And then I could say, for example, a conditional column where if index is less than two, then say, okay, otherwise choose a column that is the person column like that. So these two have been custom added. I could have renamed that as, as well. Now in this case, I find it totally okay to select them and choose remove columns. And that is because there is no risk in the code breaking because the code was one that I only put in as I added these columns. So whenever you add custom columns, it's okay to use the remove columns. Otherwise, I much prefer choosing remove other columns. All right, let's go to another use case. Now let's show you another use case. So I'm going to close and lows out of this and I'm going to show you my other data set. So I have also Austria data, and this is slightly different. This is showing it to me like this. So here I have a lot of merged cells, I have a lot of hidden rows and columns, and I have subtotals, and I also have this that says apples red because 
Power Query will not know that these two refer to red apples. So I need to fill this down first. So I'm going to show you how this same feature works with removing the right number of rows in this sort of data set. In fact, the data set has the same columns, it just has a differing number of rows. So from here, I'm going to choose get data from workbook and I'm going to go to Austria. Not physically going to go there, just going to get the data. Then I'm going to get sheet one data. I'm going to transform. By the way, there is a way to combine all of these inside one file through getting data from a folder. I have another video that explains that. So here's sheet one, two. So I'm going to say uh, hidden rows because that's inside the data. I have these hidden rows. Now, in this case, I don't have anything at the top, so I don't need to remove rows at the top. However, I do need to remove rows in between my data. Let's close this. So, um, this filter actually works in the same way. So if I click here, choose remove empty, that is always the safer one to do. But the issue there is that I have now lost my column one, my item name. So if I go back to navigation, that's not what I want to do. In fact, um, what you want to do is if you have something that is to fill down like this one, I want this one to say apples, this one to say apples, then you should always do that before you filter out rows as good practice. So in this case, I can go to this step and I can click on this column and choose transform, fill and fill down. It says, do I want to insert a step in between? Yes, I do. And now if I go back to filtered rows, I see that it's fixed like that. Next thing I can use first row as headers. And then I can remove the columns that I don't need again. And I can go to choose columns and just keep, say, these ones. So I'm going to show you how to change the data types and the quickest way to do it. Now, once I've referred to all of my column names, and that happens when you remove other columns, what you can do is just change the data types for all of them because you've already referred to it once. So you can then select all of your columns, go to the transform tab and choose detect data type. Then it's detected. This is text, number, date, and this one, it's not quite sure. So if it doesn't quite get it, or if it gets it wrong, you can manually do it over here and then change it to a decimal number like that. Now here it has got an error. It's not guessed it because in fact, the dollar sign was hard coded into the cell. So I can sort of change that with the general replace values in Power Query. Now I'm going to show you how this is future proofed. So if I go to source and I change it to say my France data, press OK. My France data then when I expand, it has a different number of blank rows at the top, but then I still do my fill down and that works okay. And then I filter and I remove empty. And look at that. It's now not only removed my top and my bottom rows, but also rows in between my data that I don't need. And in this final part, we're going to talk about the difference between how Power Query deals with blanks versus nulls. So in this value column, this cell has nothing in it and that the is blank returns true. And this next one is the empty string equals speech marks, speech marks. And that the is blank in Excel formula returns false. Confusingly, what Excel's is blank returns false is what Power Query calls a blank. And here, if we have a if function that returns a blank, then it says the word false. I'm also going to show you a complete row that is null and a complete row that is blank. So let's get this data given a range. So empty. And then let's grab the data in the data tab from table or range. And over here, you can see that this is a blank value. And if I filter that, it says null and it sells blank. 
Remove empty, we'll remove both of those as the code shows you the empty string and the word null. Now, a couple of other things here. So I also have in remove rows, I have remove blank rows. So what that does is it does, in fact, go from nine rows to five rows, and it does remove the row that is all blank and the row that is all null. It doesn't remove this one because this has a value in one cell. And that's why I prefer to choose a column that's going to have the relevant blanks and remove empty for that one. There we go. So I prefer that to choosing remove rows because in many instances, you'll have something like a title in one cell. That means you essentially want to remove it, but it's not part of the table. So that's why I prefer the filtering for remove empty that sort of tackles all of those eventualities. So I hope you liked that video. It's on how to future proof and hopefully get less errors when you remove rows and columns in Power Query. If you like this video, I have plenty others like it on Power Query, Excel, Power BI, PowerPoint, Microsoft Teams, even Zoom. Uh, subscribe to my channel for more great content. Thanks for watching.